Natural selection is about the differential survival of coded information which has power to influence its probability of being replicated, which pretty much means genes. Coded information which has the power to make copies of itself, replicator, whenever that comes into existence in the universe, it potentially could be the basis for some kind of Darwinian selection. And when that happens, you then have the opportunity for this extraordinary phenomenon which we call life. My conjecture is that if there's life elsewhere in the universe, it will be Darwinian life. That's, I think there's only one way for this hyper-complex phenomenon which we call life to arise from the laws of physics. The laws of physics just, just let you know if you throw a stone up in the air, it describes a parabola and, and, that, and that's it. But biology, without ever violating the laws of physics, does the most extraordinary things. It produces machines which can run and walk and fly and dig and, and, and swing through the trees and think and produce the whole of human technology, human art, human uh, music. This all comes about because at some point in history, about four billion years ago, a replicating entity arose. Not a, not a gene as we would now see it, but something functionally equivalent to a gene, which, because it had the power to replicate and the power to influence its own probability of replicating and replicated with slight errors, gave rise to the whole of life. If you ask me what my ambition would be, it would be that everybody would understand what an extraordinary, remarkable thing it is that they exist in a world which would otherwise just be plain physics. The key to the process is self-replication. The key to the process is that, let's call them genes because nowadays they pretty much all are genes. Genes have a different probability of surviving. The ones that survive because they have such high fidelity replication are the ones which we see in the world, the ones which uh, dominate gene pools in the world. So for me, the replicator, the gene, DNA, is absolutely key to the whole process of Darwinian natural selection. So when you ask the question, what about group selection, what about high, higher levels of selection, what about different levels of selection. Everything comes down to gene selection. Gene selection is, is fundamentally what is really going on. Now, originally, these replicating entities would have been floating free and just replicating in, in the primeval soup or what, whatever that was. But they discovered a technique of ganging together into huge robot vehicles, which we call individual organisms. So an individual organism is a unit of selection in a different sense from the replicator being a unit of selection. The replicator is a unit of selection which strictly is the thing that becomes either more numerous or less numerous in the world. Nowadays we say more numerous or less numerous in the gene pool, uh, and that's modern post-Darwinian language. But because the individual organism is such a salient unit in, in which these replicators, these genes, have ganged up together, we tend, we as biologists, tend to see the individual organism as the unit of action. The individual organism is the thing that has legs or wings, it has eyes, it has teeth, it has instincts. It's the thing that actually does something. And so it's natural for biologists to phrase their questions of purpose, of pseudo-purpose, at the level of the organism. They see the organism as striving for something, working for something, struggling to achieve something. What's it struggling to achieve? Well, for Darwin, it was struggling to achieve survival and reproduction. Nowadays, we would say it's struggling to achieve replication of the genes inside it. And this all comes about because uh, 
Well, one way of putting it, and I've often put it like this, is to say, look, look backwards at the ancestors of all modern animals, of any, any animal at any, any time. And you can say that all its ancestors... Sorry, you can say that the individual is descended from an unbroken line of successful ancestors. An unbroken line of individuals which succeeded in surviving and reproducing. What that really means is succeeded in passing on the genes that built them. So we are conduits for the genes that pass through us. We are temporary survival machines. Everything about biology can be understood in this way. Everything about biology can be understood if you say that what's really going on is differential replicator survival, gene survival in gene pools, and the way in which they do it is by controlling phenotypes, and those phenotypes in practice are nearly always bundled up into these discrete bodies, individual organisms. So if ever there is a bundle of replicators, a bundle of genes, which passes on its genes to the next generation in a single um, a single propagule. We, we do that. We, we pass on our genes in sperms or eggs. That means that all the genes in a body, in a mammal body, in a vertebrate body, in, in an animal body, a normal animal with sexual reproduction, because all the genes in that body have the identical expectation of getting into, the, into future generations, namely leaving the present body in a sperm or an egg. That means that all the genes in a body are pulling for the same end. They all have the same, so to speak, goal. If they didn't, and some of them might not, um, viruses, for example, have a different goal of being sneezed out or being... Or being a spat out or whatever it might be and they of course are quite different and they do not cooperate with the rest of the genes in the body but all the genes that have the same expectation of the future the same expectation of leaving the present body and getting into the next body they cooperate they work together that's why bodies are such coherent holes that's why all the limbs and all the all the sense organs work together it's simply because all the genes that built them have the same exit route to the next generation. The minority that don't, we call things like viruses, uh, and they have a different exit route, and they don't cooperate, and they may, and they may kill you. So, al although it's true that the, the great majority of survival machines are actually discrete organisms, um, that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. And if genes can influence phenotypes that are outside the body, then they will do so. And this is the extended phenotype, and uh, the simplest sort of extended phenotype would be an artifact like a bird's nest. So a bird's nest is an organ. It's an organ in just the same sense as a heart or a kidney is an organ, but it just happens to be outside the body, and it happens to be made of grass and sticks, rather the, than being made of the cells that contain the genes. But nevertheless, it's a phenotype which is produced by the animal's nervous system, working through nest-building behaviour. And it does exactly the same kind of thing, namely preserving the genes in the form of eggs and chicks, as organs of the body, like uh, kidneys and livers and muscles. The next kind of extended phenotype that I've talked about is um, hosts of parasites, because there are these spectacular examples, which Dan Dennett is fond of quoting, for example, of parasites which influence their hosts in order to, to get into the next generation. And a host body to a parasite gene is like a bird's nest. It's, it's influenced by the genes. We don't, we don't normally put it that way. We normally say that the parasite, the fluke or whatever it is, the whole fluke influences the whole snail to get itself passed on. But in fact, if you think at the, at the genetic level, the genes are influencing the fluke's phenotype, which in turn influences the snail's phenotype, to enhance the propagation of the fluke's genes. 
into the next generation. So there's no reason to draw a line around the fluke's body and say, well, outside that it's no longer proper phenotype. It is proper phenotype. It's just that you have to think outside the box, in this case outside the snail, um, in order to get the true relationship between genes and phenotypes. And then generalizing further, uh, a cuckoo in a nest influences the behavior of its host by various stimuli, by having a bright red gape and squawking in the right way and so on. And uh, once again, just as the fluke influences the snail to get itself passed on to the next generation, the cuckoo influences the reed warbler to get itself, to get its genes passed on to the next generation. And the change in reed warbler behavior can properly be regarded as phenotypic expression of cuckoo genes. Now this, this is my vi vision of life. My vision of life is that everything stems from replicators, which are in practice DNA molecules on this planet. The, the replicators reach out into the world to influence their own probability of being passed on. Mostly they don't reach further than the individual body in which they sit. But that's a matter of practice, not a matter of principle. The individual organism can be defined as that set of phenotypic products which are produced by... Uh, which, which, which have a single route of exit of the genes into, into, into the future. That's not true of the cuckoo reed warbler case, but it is true of the, of the ordinary animal body. So the organism, the individual organism, is a deeply salient unit. It's a unit of selection in the sense that I've called a vehicle. There are two kinds of unit of selection. It, the difference is a semantic one. They're both units of selection, but one is the replicator, and what it does is get itself copied. So more and more copies of itself go into the world. The other kind of unit is the vehicle. It doesn't get itself copied. What it does is work to copy the replicators which have come down to it through the generations and which is going to pass on to future generations. So we have this individual replicator dichotomy. They're both units of selection, but in different senses. It's important to, to understand that they, are, um, that they are different senses. Now, because the individual organism is such a salient unit, biologists after Darwin got into the habit of seeing the organism as the unit of action, and therefore they asked the question, what is the organism maximizing? What mathematical function is the organism maximizing? Fitness is the answer. So fitness was coined as a mathematical expression of that which the organism is maximizing. But of course, what fitness really is, or ought to be, if we understand it properly, is gene survival. Now, um, for a long time, fitness was equated in people's minds with, with, re, re, with reproduction, with having the num a large number of children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. Bill Hamilton, and others, but mostly Bill Hamilton, realized that you had to generalize that, because if what's really going on is working to pass on genes, offspring the grandchildren, etc., are not the only ways of passing on genes. An organism can work to enhance the survival and reproduction of its siblings, its nephews, its nieces, uh, its cousins, and so on. And Hamilton worked out the mathematics of that. I think it was unfortunate that Hamilton, having realized this very important insight, chose to stick with the individual organism as the entity of action. He therefore coined the phrase inclusive fitness, inclusive fitness, as the mathematical function which an individual organism will maximize if what it's really doing is maximizing its gene survival. It's a rather complicated thing to calculate. It's difficult to calculate in practice. And this has led to a certain amount of um, not hostility, but a certain amount of scepticism about inclusive fitness as a measure. Scepticism which I share, uh, but for me, the remedy to that scepticism is to say, well, forget about the organism and concentrate on the gene itself. Ask yourself, as Hamilton also did, 
Ask yourself, if I were a gene, what would I do to maximize my propagation into the future? Hamilton did that, but he also, I think, laid her in a, a sort of false trail, strictly correct but not helpful, by saying, if I'm an individual, what would I do to maximize my gene survival? Both ways of, of phrasing it are correct. They're, they're both correct if you can get the calculation right, but one of them is rather harder to do. If you're trying to do uh, intuitive Darwinism, if you're trying to work out what would you expect to happen in the world, I think it's better to ask the question, what would I do if I were a gene, rather than what would I do if I were an elephant? Um, in both cases, this is a personification. We don't, nobody really thinks that either genes or elephants scratch their heads and think, what would I do? But it's a useful trick, a useful dodge, when you're trying to get the right answer. As, say, a field biologist in the Serengeti. It's a useful trick to say, what would I do if I was a... And you can, that, that, you can fill in the end of that sentence by saying, either if I was a gene or if I was an elephant. And you'll get the right answer... If in the gene case you, you concentrate on self-replication, and if in the elephant case you concentrate on passing on genes. So we have these two logically equivalent ways of expressing what's going on in Darwinism. Both of them Hamilton used. There's the what would I do if I was a gene way of doing it, and there's the what would I do if I was an elephant or an aardvark way of, way of doing it, and they're both correct. I think some of the opposition to Hamilton, which has recently surfaced, is because people have realised that inclusive fitness is not a very practical way of doing things. It's a difficult thing to calculate. And my, my suggestion would be, and I, I actually said this to Hamilton, um, my suggestion would be to abandon inclusive fitness and to concentrate instead on personification of the gene and then you'll get the right answer. George C. Williams in 1966 wrote a, a brilliant book, um, Adaptation and Natural Selection, which uh, sort of roughly the same time as Hamilton was working, and they both tumbled to the same truth, uh, which is that what's really going on in natural selection is survival of genes. And Williams was eloquent on this. Williams said things like, um, Socrates may have had any number of of children, we don't, we don't know, we don't know that. Uh, but what, what, what really Socrates passed on, if he passed on anything, was genes. It's genes that pass through the generations. And so, whenever you're talking about teleonomy, whenever you're talking about um, the, the pseudo purpose, which is, which is, which we see in, in life, what's it for? What's, what's the adaptation for? What, who, who benefits? Cui bono? Whenever you ask that question you should be looking at the level of the gene. Williams realised that, Hamilton realised that. In The Blind Watchmaker, I wanted to get across the idea that cumulative selection can give rise to immense complexity and dramatic changes. And uh, so I wrote a computer programme for the Macintosh, which uh, presented on the screen uh, a range of phenotypes which were built by an, an algorithm which I call th its embryology, which was actually a tree-growing algorithm. And the shape of the tree was governed by genes. So there were nine genes, I think, in the first version. And uh, so what the user saw on the screen was a parent biomorph, as I called them, in the middle, and um, eight other biomorphs around, which were the offspring. They were built by genes, which were nine numbers. The genes could mutate by either having a small amount added to their value or a small amount subtracted from their value. And so all the nine biomorphs looked a little bit different. They were obviously descended from the same parent, but they were a little bit different. And you could choose with the mouse which one to breed from. It glided to the center of the screen, produced eight offspring and uh, and so on, went on and on, and through generation after generation. You could breed anything you like. It was a most extraordinary experience to uh, breed massively different shapes from the original by gradual degrees, and they came out looking like insects and flowers and all sorts of things. I'm very pleased about, to, to sort of say now, 
that although I thought I'd lost these biomorphs because modern Macs don't run the, the software that old Macs do, a, a, a wonderful man uh, called Alan Cannon in Kentucky wrote to me and said he wanted to revive them. So I sent him all my old Pascal code, uh, which would no longer run. And he's now hard at work and he's producing uh, Phoenix from the Ashes, my old programs, and I'm simply delighted by this. Um, that's an aside. Uh, I then went to the Artificial Life Conference um, organized by Chris Langton, and uh, I gave a talk called The Evolution of Evolvability, which I think was the first time the phrase had ever been used, and it's now been used, it's been used quite a lot. Um, the original Biomorph program had nine genes. Uh, I then later in enlarged it to 16 genes. I, in I added genes that did things like segmentation, that made, that had uh, biomorphs that could, um, that were arranged serially along the body, like, an, like a centipede, which has lots of different um, segments, or like a lobster, which has lots of segments, but each segment can be a little bit different. I had genes that did, ha had symmetries of various um, kinds. So I increased the number of genes from 9 to 16, and the repertoire of biomorphs that it became possible to breed then dramatically increased. It was still, still limited, but nevertheless it increased. Uh, and it occurred to me that this was a good metaphor for radical changes in embryology that happen at certain important times in evolution. For example, segmentation. I just mentioned segmentation. The, the very first segmented animal had some kind of major mutation which gave it two segments instead of one. I'm guessing it may have been three, but I mean, it, it, it can't have had just one and a half segments. There must have been at least two. It duplicated. It duplicated everything about the body. If you look at the, the body of, a, of an earthworm or a centipede, it's like a train with a lot of trucks. Each truck is similar to the neighboring trucks, maybe identical. Before the origin of segmentation in the ancestors of earthworms or the ancestors of centipedes, the ancestor of verte vertebrates, uh, animals must have evolved, they're just one single segment and they would have evolved in the same sort of way as my biomorphs did when they had only nine genes. Then the first segmented animal was born. It must have been radically different from its, from its parents. This must have been a major mutation. And as soon as the first segmented animal was born, with two segments, the same as each other probably. And then uh, there wasn't a difficult thing to do in one sense because all the embryological machinery to, to make one segment was already there. And so to, to double it would have been obviously a major step, but nevertheless all the machinery is there. It's not like inventing a whole new organ like an eye. That cannot happen. It's got to happen by gradual cumulative selection, which is the main message of the blind watchmaker. But once you've got the machinery to make an eye, or to make a, a vertebra, or to make a, a, a heart, or anything like that, you could make two, it, it, because the machinery is already there. That's what segmentation is. And so when segmentation was invented by some kind of macro mutation, a whole new flowering of evolution became possible. And vertebrates, arthropods, annelids, all exploit this new embryological trick of segmentation. Um, and I illustrated this with my biomorphs, because when I added the segmentation gene, which was a macro mutation, which I actually had to program in, when I added it, uh, it meant that a whole new flowering of morphology could appear on the screen. You could evolve much more exciting animals uh, because segmentation was there. Similarly with the genes for symmetry. I had genes for m doing kind of mirror image morphology in two different planes. And immediately I started being able to breed things like flowers and butterflies, beautiful creatures.
The evolution of evolvability then is an evolutionary change which makes a radical alteration in embryology and that opens up floodgates of further evolution which were not possible before. Segmentation is one example, sex may be another one, uh, torsion in mollusks may be another one. These are major changes which I think are rare, they may happen once every hundred million years, but, but there's kind of normal evolution which goes on by the normal cumulative slow gradual process that we mostly teach about. But every now and again I suspect there's a major, a major jump, a macro mutation, uh, which opens up new floodgates and segmentation would be would be the best example and this really I, I was really led to think about this by the addition of seven more genes to my original nine gene biomorph and that's what I talked about at Chris Langton's um, artificial life conference and I called it the evolution of evolvability I incorporated uh, these, these ideas of evolution of evolvability in Climbing Mount Improbable, which is a bit similar to The Blind Watchmaker, but has a lot more, a lot more in it. And by then, I'd added a whole lot more genes, in this, in this case introducing colour, so we now have, have coloured biomorphs. And perhaps rather more interestingly, I teamed up with Ted Kaler, whom I met, He's, he was one of Apple star programmers. I met him at the uh, Artificial Life conference. And after that we collaborated on a new project which I called Arthromorphs, which was uh, somewhat similar to Biomorphs, but with a totally different kind of embryology. And much more based upon segmentation and much more based upon especially arthropod segmentation. And the Arthromorph program didn't require the programmer, namely me, to introduce the new watershed changes, the new macro mutations which led to new flowerings of evolution. It happened internally, it happened in the computer. They really were macro mutations. Uh, and so that was a big step in my use of computers in both understanding and teaching about evolution. I think one of the things that I've always done is uh, not make a clear separation between books that are aimed at popularizing, books that are aimed at explaining things to other people, and books that explain things to myself or explain things to my scientific colleagues. Uh, I think it's been overdone, the separation between doing science and popularizing science has been o overdone. And I have found that the exercise of explaining to other people, which I suppose I've been fairly successful at, is greatly helped by the fact that I first have to explain it to myself. And explaining it to myself, I mean, the, the Biomorph program, which I originally wrote to explain to students, and, and I use them in student practicals, the Biomorph programs led me to think anew for myself, uh, stimulated me to understand much better about evolution, stimulated me to understand about the evolution of evolvability in a way that I hadn't before. Yeah. Nobody knows whether there's life elsewhere in the universe. Um, I think there probably is. The number of stars in the universe is something like 10 to the 22. Uh, and most of them have probably got planets. It would be pretty astonishing if we were u unique. It would go against the lessons of history. We'd, we'd, you know, we'd, we'd, we're not the centre of the universe, etc. Um, science fiction writers try to speculate about what life elsewhere might be like. Um, I have one contribution to make, which is that I think that however weird and alien and strange and different 
life elsewhere might be, we can say one thing about it, which is that it will be, when we, if we discover it, it will turn out to be Darwinian life. I, th I think there's only one way for uh, the lead of pure physics to be transmuted into the gold of complex life, and that is differential replicator survival, which is Darwinism in its most general sense. So I would stick my neck out and say that when and if we ever discover life elsewhere in the universe, it will be Darwinian. It will be based upon something like DNA, probably not DNA, but something like DNA in the sense of a, an ultra-high-fidelity self-replicating coding system uh, with the capability of producing great variety, which is what uh, DNA does. So what I call universal Darwinism is the doctrine, almost, that the, the one thing we know about life everywhere is that it's Darwinian life. Uh, I gave a talk called Universal Darwinism at the one of the Darwin centenary conferences, um, the one in Cambridge, and I based it upon looking at all the alternatives that someone might have suggested, like Lamarckism, inheritance of acquired characteristics, the principle of use and disuse. And the point I tried to make is that contrary to what most other biologists have said, the thing that's wrong with Lamarckism is not just that it doesn't work in practice, that, that, that acquired characteristics are not, as a matter of fact, inherited. Various biologists, including Ernst Meyer, have said Lamarck's theory is a fine theory, but unfortunately, acquired characteristics are not inherited. The point I made that was that even if they were inherited, the Lamarckian theory is nothing like a big enough theory to do the job of producing complex adaptation. The Lamarckian theory depends upon uh, use and disuse. The more you use your arm muscles, the bigger they get. That's fine, that happens. Uh, and then inheritance of acquired characteristics. You pass on your bigger muscles to your children. Um, Maya said, that's a perfectly good theory. The only trouble is it doesn't work because acquired characteristics are not inherited, which of course is true. But um, the point I was making was that even if it was true, the principle wouldn't work to produce real interesting biological evolution. Almost all muscles are fine. That's one thing that does grow bigger when you, when you use them. But something like an eye, the, the, the delicate focusing mechanism of the eye, the transparency of the eye, the, the huge number of, of um, light-sensitive cells, three different colour coding and so on, that doesn't come about by use and disuse. The more you use your eyes, they don't become more... The lens doesn't become more transparent as photons wash through it. Uh, Eyes, beget, eyes come, become better because every single tiny mutation that improves the, the, the eye, as Darwin said, nature is daily and hourly scrutinising. So every little tiny change, no matter how deeply buried in internal cellular biochemistry it is, if it has any effect whatever on survival and reproduction, natural selection will pick it up. The Lamarckian principle will work only for very, very crude gross things like muscles getting bigger when you, when you use them. As we look around the world in which we live, what we see is stupefyingly complicated man-made machines like this camera that you're filming me with, this, this recording machine, this computer, um, cars, ships, planes. Uh, these are not produced directly by natural selection. These are produced by human ingenuity, by human, human brains working together, no one human can, can make a Boeing 747. I mean, there are, this is a cooperative enterprise involving lots of humans, involving lots of computers. Uh, it's a, a fantastic extension of uh, the Darwinian substrate. So the, the, the principles that give rise to the very strong, Dar uh, the very strong design of a of a plane or a car or a computer. These all come from human brains. But that's not the ultimate explanation. The human brains themselves have to come 
from Darwinian natural selection. So if we go to other planets and, and discover extremely complicated technology, that technology itself won't be the direct product of Darwinian selection, uh, it, but it will be the product ultimately of Darwinian selection, of the brains, whatever they call them on that planet. Um, it, it, it's arguable that something, this is an, a different kind of argument now, it's arguable that something like Darwinism does go on in human technology. That, that when, a, when, a, when a human designer is designing on a drawing board, he designs something, doesn't like it, tosses it in the bin, gets a fresh bit of paper, designs a slight variation of it and so on. There might be a Darwinian element to that. That's, what I'm, that's not what I'm talking about. Um, I'm saying that... that um, a, 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 a wholly new, or at least partly new, kind of design came into the world when human brains started to exercise ingenuity, especially social ingenuity, cultural ingenuity. Um, but the ultimate source of that power is evolved brains, and the evolved brains have to come about by some version of Darwinian selection, which on other planets might be very different, but it will still be, I conjecture, I put my shirt on, it being Darwinian.